In the last episode, the crew of Red Dwarf finally escaped from the grip of the virtual reality game Better Than Life, and Lister and the Cat were taken to the medical unit to recover, while Rimmer and Crichton went to assess the state of the ship. They are dismayed to discover that Holly's encounter with the talking toaster has left him with an IQ of 12,000, but only one minute and ten seconds to live, and he has switched himself off to preserve his runtime. They are even more dismayed to discover that the engines are dead, and that to get them up and running will take three weeks, which is exactly how long it will take the approaching planet they can see on the scanner to hit their ship. Chris Barry performs episode four, Lister and the cat stared up at the video monitor on the ceiling. The only video they both agreed was an indisputable classic was the Flintstones, which they watched for 15 or 16 hours every day. After perhaps 90 hours of watching the Flintstones, something strange seemed to happen to Lister. Cat, he grunted without removing his eyes from the screen. Huh? The cat grunted back. Is it me? Or is Wilma Flintstone incredibly sexy? The cat swivelled and looked at him, then turned his head back to the screen. Wilma Flintstone is, without question, the most desirable woman who ever lived. Lister looked at him to see if he was serious. He was. What do you think of Betty? Betty Rubble? The cat mulled it over. Well, I would go with Betty, but I'd be thinking of Wilma. They both lapsed into silent reverie. What are we doing? Lister said finally. Why are we talking about making love to Wilma Flintstone? You're right. We're nuts. This is an insane conversation. Lister shook his head sadly. She'd never leave Fred and we know it. Crichton's face when it appeared through the recovery bay's hatchway was simultaneously wearing two expressions. The bottom half was calm, benign and kindly. The top half, his eyes and forehead, was shot through with panic. Now, there's absolutely no reason for concern, but we're going to have to move you. Where to? Nowhere in particular. I just thought it would be nice. Crichton, I'm not getting on that stretcher until you tell me what's going on. Crichton smiled. If you absolutely must know, there's a tiny little planet that might be possibly heading on a collision course with us, but there's absolutely nothing to worry about. A planet? Why doesn't the ship just get out of the way? The engines are sort of deadish. Now please, get on the stretcher. Lister tried to wrestle himself upright in his medisuit. What does Holly say? Well, Holly is sort of deadish, too. Now please get on the stretcher and try and relax. Crichton patted the stretcher and watched helplessly as Lister and the cat unvelcroed their medisuits, ripped off the biofeedback sensors, and belted out of the room and down the corridor. It fell to Rimmer to give Holly the news that they couldn't take him with them. He sat at his sloping architect's desk in the sleeping quarters, bathed in the emergency lighting and reread the speech he'd written. With practice, Rimmer found he could say the whole message in just under two seconds. This still left Holly a full 53 seconds of runtime to enjoy in whatever way he chose. Rimmer voice-activated the reboot disc, and Holly's pixelized image assembled itself on the sleeping quarter's vid screen. Rimmer went into his speech. Planet collision course engines dead, impact 12 hours, manning ship, sorry, bye. Holly blinked. You what? Planet collision calls engines dead and back 12 hours of ownership. Sorry, bye. I can't understand a word. Say it slower. Planet? Yes. Collision course? Yes. Engines dead? Right. Impact 12 hours? With you. Abandoning ship? Oh. Sorry? Yes. Bye. Within two seconds, Holly absorbed the data from the scanner scope, mulled the problem over, and said two words. Drive room. Then he switched himself off with less than 25 seconds of runtime remaining. They heard the babble and chatter of operational machinery long before they passed under the colossal archway that led into the drive room itself. What the smeg is going on? Lister screamed above the machine noise. 
Crichton stooped and picked up a section of printout. It's machine speak. Calculations. Above them, the immense screen which covered the entire ceiling rippled into life. Solution, it read. Below that was a 3D graphics display of Holly's plan. It was quite the most audacious piece of astro-navigation ever attempted in the entire history of the universe. On the screen was a simulation of the binary star system in which they were now marooned, motionless. At the bottom of the screen was a vector graphic of Red Dwarf. At the top of the screen was the blue ice planet, hurtling towards them on its collision course. To the left was a small sun, and to the right was its larger twin. Both were orbited by single planets. Starbug, Red Dwarf's beetle-shaped transport craft, then flashed on the screen. The craft blipped a course towards the right-hand sun and fired something into its core. The sun flared. Its planet was torn from its orbit and hurled towards the center of the screen. Lister watched, bewildered and bemused, as the display dissolved into a dazzling array of plotted lines and arrows. When the screen finally cleared, all three planets now orbited the sun on the left, and Red Dwarf remained intact. I think he's playing pool. Said Lister, with planets. Is that possible? Lister creaked into one of the console seats and shook his head grimly. It's not going to work. If Holly thinks he can use the red planet to pot the blue planet into the left-hand sun's orbit, then he's out to breakfast, lunch, and tea. Lister, what are you drivelling about? Rimmer snorted in contempt. We're talking about a computer with an IQ of twelve thousand three hundred and sixty-eight. That doesn't mean he can play pool. I can. Egbert's arms on a Friday night couldn't get me off that table, and I promise you that shot's not going to come off. He's topped it. That's what he's done. That planet's off the table and into somebody's glass of beer. It's a complete miscue, and I say we chuck Holly's coordinates in the bin and let me take the shot. Rimmer stood apart from the rest of the group. I say we put it to the vote. On the one hand, we have a computer with an IQ in five figures who has a complete and total grasp of astrophysics, and on the other hand, we have Lister who is a complete gimp. To whose hands do we entrust our lives, the safety of this vessel, and the future of everything? Lister, what's your vote? I vote for me. Rimmer smirked. I vote for Holly. One all. Critters. Well. Even though I agree it's insane and suicidal, I'm afraid I have to side with the human. It's my programming. Rimmer's smile receded like a fizzling fuse. Cat, I agree with you, buddy. But the thing is, I can never bring myself to vote for someone with your dress sense. I'm gonna vote for Lister. Lister ran the final check down on the Starbug's instrument panel. We're ready to go, Crichton. Where's the cat? He should be on his way, sir. The cat's face appeared next to Crichton's on the vid screen. I'm not coming. Lister bunched up his face. What? This is the way I see it. If everything goes okay, everyone's safe, no problem. If something goes wrong, the guys on Starbug get whacked out twenty minutes ahead of the guys on Red Dwarf. There's a lot of things a guy can do in twenty minutes. I'm staying here with Crichton. Lister crouched over the flatbed scanner, one eye closed, his nose almost parallel with the screen. There, at the far end of the screen, was the blue ice planet, the planet Lister had designated as the blue ball. To the right, circling around the bigger of the twin suns, was the planet Lister had christened the cue ball. The cue ball would strike the blue ball and send it into the orbit of the left-hand sun, or, as Lister preferred to call it, the pocket. It was a straightforward pot. He'd made identical shots thousands of times before. Without taking his eyes from the scanner, he grabbed a six-pack of double-strength lager out of Starbug's tiny fridge and ripped off a ring pull. He was halfway through his fourth can before Rimmer broke his vow of silence. How many of those are you going to drink? I'm going to drink all six. I always play me best pool when I've had a few beers. Steadies the nerves. I'm not going to get blasted. Just nicely drunk. Lister sucked at his can. It's an easier shot if we're over here. He tapped the screen at a point midway between Red Dwarf and the oncoming planet. So if you miss, we get a planet in our face. 
I'm not going to miss. Mish? What? You said mish. I'm not going to mish, you said. You're pissed. Lister fired up the thrusters and wrenched the bug towards its new coordinates. God, I could murder the curry. The planet was close now. It occupied almost half of Rimmer's Navicomp screen and was growing steadily in size as it thundered towards them. Lister screwed up the empty sixth can of lager and he nestled his nose into the bifocal viewer. He lined up the cross wires on the sun around which the Q planet spun. He shifted his legs until he felt his center of balance. It looked right, but he waited. He waited until it felt right. Then it felt right. Space faded away, and he was back in the Egbeth arms, and this was just another shot to stay on the table. He was on the eighth ball, and all it needed was a push, with just enough bottom to avoid the in-off. He could do it. He played the shot. He touched the launch button and increased the pressure steadily and evenly in one smooth movement. With a primal scream, the missile ripped from its housing under Starbug's belly and sizzled towards the distant sun. Lister turned to the scanner screen and watched. The whole sequence took eight hours to play out, but to Rimmer, it seemed like eight years. To Lister, it seemed like eight seconds. The missile plunged into the sun's inferno, and a giant solar flare licked up from its raging surface, struck Lister's Q planet, and slammed it out of orbit. The Q planet yammered through space towards the intersection coordinates. Almost immediately, Rimmer realized it was going to miss, and not by a little, by a lot. It was going to streak harmlessly across the path of the oncoming ice world to be captured in orbit around the left-hand sun. Lister had sunk the cue ball. They didn't exchange a word for three hours. The Q planet flew into orbit around the opposite sun. It looped round the far side in an erratic ellipse, then thumped into the sun's resident planet and sent that curling out into space. The resident planet swept across the scanner screen, cannoned into the ice world and hammered it into the orbit of the right-hand sun before elegantly backspinning a return path to its original position. She rides! Lister wiggled his hips and arms in a touch-up shuffle. She rides! You jammy bastard. How can that be jammy? I pocketed all three planets for one stroke. How can that be a fluke? Oh, do smeg off. Lister was doing some serious damage to his third six-pack and watching the fast-motion replay for the 171st time while Rimmer slept off the journey back to Red Dwarf in the bug's one and only sleep couch when a planet hit them. Which planet hit them, Lister never discovered. In fact, it was the Q planet, which had been knocked out of its new orbit by the backspinning resident planet. Technically, the bug wasn't actually hit by the planet. It was the planet's slipstream. But that was enough to flick the craft upside down and send it on a corkscrew death dive towards the ice world. Only the Starbug's dome-shaped drive section, scorched black from its encounter with the ice planet's stratosphere, poked up through the slow, shifting sea of snow dunes. Resting against the foot of the glacier, it fizzled and steamed for almost five days in the unrelenting blizzard before there was any sign of life. Finally, the small hatchway chinked open and light gushed out into the black Arctic night. Lister's face, encircled by parka fur, appeared grimacing in the opening. His gloved fingers folded around the rim of the hatchway before the blinding wind forced back the door and tried to close it on his head. Lister fell out of the bug and teetered on a ledge of packed snow. He quickly discovered the only way to remain upright was to lean into the wind. He had to incline his body at an angle of 50 degrees. He felt absurd, but there was no other way of staying on his feet. He managed three steps before the blizzard inflated his parker hood and knocked him off the ledge. He slithered down the bank and dropped into the trough cut by the Starbug's path. Gradually, he hauled himself to his feet and unfastened the small snow trowel which was tied to his waist. He looked at it. It measured scarcely four inches across. He looked at what little of the bug was visible above the drift. At a rough estimate, he would have to shift about 800 tons of snow if the bug was ever to move. 
He tried two trowelfuls before the erratic blizzard swirled into the trough and tossed him like a broken kite into a snowbank 50 feet away. Rimmer stooped over the communications console and barked into the microphone. Mayday! Mayday! Can you read me? Come in, please! The Starbug's inner door hammered open and a blizzard stumbled in, followed by Lister. Lister hurled himself against the inner door and fought it closed. It's useless. Lister flung his gloves against the bug's far bulkhead. You can hardly stand up, never mind dig it out. He sneered at the static on the screen. Five days had gone by, broadcasting on all frequencies, and still Red Dwarf hadn't acknowledged the SOS. How much food is there? Rimmer nodded at the navigation console. I made a full list on the dictopad. The menu was meagre indeed. Half a bag of smoky bacon crisps, a tin of mustard powder, a brown lemon, three stale water biscuits, two bottles of vinegar, and a tube of Bongella gum ointment. Lister looked up from the pad. Is that it? Nothing else? Just a pot noodle. Oh, and I found a tin of dog food on the tool shelf. Misery hissed through Lister's gritted teeth. Well, pretty obvious what gets eaten last. I can't stand pot noodles. Suddenly, the communications console crackled into life. Crichton was talking to them. But something was wrong with the sound. All they could hear was a dull, resonant bass throb, a slow-motion growl. Lister played with the frequency controls, but couldn't improve the sound reception. Then something happened to Rimmer. It was hardly noticeable at first, but after a couple of hours it was plain that he'd started slowing down. Talking to him was like conducting a transatlantic phone conversation with a bad connection. Occasionally he would flash and become two-dimensional or lose all colour. Lister didn't mention it at first. Rimmer had always been extremely sensitive about his status as a hologram. Rimmer's voice had dropped two octaves, and trying to hold a conversation with him was like talking person to person to Paul Robeson on Mars. Rimmer? What's happening? A two-minute pause, then... Do No. Something must be wrong with your signal from the ship. The remote hologrammatic relay's not getting through properly. The conversation that followed was brief in content, but took the best part of half a day to complete. The essence of the dialogue was that the signal from the ship that projected Rimmer's image was slowing down and weakening. When the signal became too faint to transmit, the hologrammatic projection unit would automatically flick from remote to local, and Rimmer would be regenerated fully functional back on Red Dwarf. Well, that's good. He can find out what's keeping them. Tell them where I am. I'll be back. Trust me. Rimmer blipped off and reformed in the hologrammatic projection unit regeneration chamber aboard Red Dwarf. Instantly, he knew something was wrong. But not with him, with time. Lister had his first meal in four days, 16 hours after Rimmer had vanished. It was garnished with potato crisps, topped by crumbled water biscuits, sprinkled with mustard, and decorated with flower twirls of Bongella gum ointment. But it was still dog food. A dozen times he dug in his fork and held the quivering mass centimetres from his lips, but he just couldn't bring himself to put it in his mouth and swallow. So he waited. He waited until he was so hungry he didn't care. Until the dog food wasn't dog food. Until it was a prime slab of fillet steak sizzling in a creamy, fresh blue cheese sauce. He slid the wobbling forkful between his lips. He chewed. He chewed a bit more. Then he swallowed. He sat for a while. Well, he thought, now I know why dogs lick their testicles. It's to get rid of the taste of the food. He placed the fork back on the plate, curled up and fell asleep. He awoke to the sound of creaking metal. Creaking metal and running water. He unzipped his sleep bag. 
His clothes were wet. He was sweating. Lister clawed his way up the ship and staggered to a viewport window. Ice World was melting. The warm kiss of its new sun was thawing the planet which had been frozen for countless millennia. Thick grey rivers gushed down the faces of shrinking glaciers. Mountains were moving, gliding with majestic grace across the liquid landscape. And Starbug was picking up speed, skidding helplessly downhill. Under the circumstances, Lister did the only sane thing. He crawled back to the bunk, bent his pillow in a U around his ears, and became the first man ever to sleep through a melting ice age. Something was wrong with time. Rimmer stepped out of the regeneration booth. As he raised his left leg and thrust it forward, it telescoped out 40 feet down the room. Instinctively, he flicked out his right leg to retain his balance. But his right leg bolted down the room, overtaking his left. It took three more rubbery steps until a bout of nausea forced him to stop. He turned back and looked down the room towards a digital wall clock. The minute digits were hammering over so fast they were little more than a blur. Rimmer started to head back for the door at the clock end to make his way to the ship's status room. To his alarm, he found that thrusting his legs out in this direction made them shrink. They concertinaed into themselves so he looked like a bad impression of Groucho Marx chasing after Margaret Dumont. Something was happening to the clock. The nearer he got to it, the slower it appeared to move. Finally, he reached the end of the suite and stood under the clock. Now it was moving perfectly normally. The digits read, Monday, 1302. He started to head for the status room. His right leg thumped down, short, wide and elephantine, while his left tapered elegantly out beside him. He waddled on his two strange new legs into the status room, sat down at the console desk and scanned the bank of security monitors. The problem was ship-wide. Time was moving at different speeds in every single room. 200 yards down the corridor, it was Monday afternoon. Here, it was Tuesday morning. It took him nearly an hour to work it out. The closer you got to the front of the ship, the slower time was moving. It was as if some gigantic force were sucking in time, corrupting it, slowing it down. There were only two things Rimmer knew of that could produce such a syndrome. And since he'd never in his life consumed a magic mushroom, that left only one alternative. He prayed he was wrong. He was wrong about most things and always had been. Why should he be right about this? He cheered up a little, confident in his own awesome capacity for incompetence, and asked the security computer to activate a sweep search for Crichton and the cat. It found them in one of the engine rooms to the rear of the ship, frantically trying to restart the engines. Rimmer called for a voice link. Crichton? Lister's marooned on the ice planet. He's starving to death. We've got to get down and help him. What the smeg's happening? Crichton replied in a garbled falsetto. Speak slowly, said Rimmer, as quick and high-pitched as he could. I have to speak fast and squeaky, and you have to speak slow and low, otherwise we won't make sense of each other. Crichton blinked into the video shot. Something is wrong. He chirruped helpfully. Oh, really? Rimmer squeaked back sarcastically. How enlightening! It's Tuesday here, Monday next door, and you think something's wrong. What are you talking about? Crichton said. It's Friday. He twisted the security camera so it pointed at the wall clock. Friday? Rimmer squinted at the readout. But which Friday? Is it last Friday or next Friday? It's this Friday, said Crichton. What's the date? Fifteenth. So it's a week next Friday? There was a hiatus. Nobody could think of anything to say. I'm coming down, Rimmer said finally. I'll be there in a sec. At last! The cat turned from testing the final piston housing and stood hands on hips in his red silk boiler suit with gold trimming. Where you been, buddy? <laughs> I ran all the way, Rimmer panted. I can't have been more than five minutes. You've been over a week! Rimmer glanced at the clock. It was Saturday the 23rd. Crichton's head poked round the corner of the piston housing. We're ready and primed. Let's start the engines. 
Crichton stabbed in the start-up sequence, and the massive pistons smashed the engines into life. OK! The cat slid out of his silk boiler suit, revealing a quilted lame jumpsuit underneath. Flip this baby into reverse and let's scoot! The engine noise changed pitch, becoming a strangulated thudding whine. Three pairs of eyes fixed on the speed-bearing readout. It scarcely changed. More power, said the cat. Get that pedal on the metal. Sluice that juice. We're on full reverse thrust. The cat shouldered Crichton out of the way and jabbed pointlessly at the controls. It can't be, novelty condom head. We're still moving forwards. Look. Crichton pointed at the display. We're using all the power we've got. It's true, then. Rimmer slumped into the console chair. What's true? Rimmer looked up, red-eyed with fear. We're being sucked into a black hole. Red Dwarf, Better Than Life, was written by Grant Naylor and performed by Chris Barry. Additional music and effects were by Nick Graham. Technical presentation by John Etchells. Produced by Chris Wallace.